Hello and thanks for joining us here on France 24 for France In Focus. This week we've headed north to Calvados in Normandy for a special programme about the first Norman King of England, William the Conqueror. This precisely 950 years after he won the Battle of Hastings. His life began here at the Chateau de Falaise, a castle which has changed beyond all recognition in the centuries following his birth. The young Duke of Normandy's childhood was anything but ordinary, but after he consolidated power here in his own duchy, he gathered his troops and went on to win the Battle of Hastings on the 14th of October, 1066. He was crowned King of England 10 weeks later. These events completely transforming the course of European history. Let's take a look. Most know him as William the Conqueror, but before earning that title, he was called William the Bastard. Born in 1027, he's the son of Duke Robert and a Falaise Tanner's daughter. At just eight, he inherits Normandy when his father dies while on a pilgrimage. Twelve years of anarchy later, William, with the King of France's aid, wins the Battle of Valles Dune and forces the rebels into submission. At 23, he marries Matilda, the daughter of the Count of Flanders, and cements his status as a feudal lord. January 1066, his cousin Edward the Confessor, King of England, dies with no successor. William believes the right should be his, but the Anglo-Saxon nobility has other ideas. They put their own champion, Harold Godwin, on the throne, just two years after he'd sworn fealty to William in Normandy. The insult can't be forgiven, and the Norman noble arms his fleet, taking 8,000 men across the Channel to conquer the kingdom. Both sides finally clash in open warfare near Hastings on October 14, 1066. William leads his cavalry from the front, spurring his soldiers to action. During the battle, Harold takes an arrow to the eye and dies. Two months later, the Normans are in London, and on Christmas Day, William's crowned in Westminster Abbey. It's just the beginning of the invasion of England. William begins installing trusted allies to positions of power, erects castles, and bloodily suppresses any revolt. By the end of the 1070s, his power's untrammeled. Even the King of France stands in the Duke-turned-royal's shadow. The armies of both would meet on the battlefield in 1087 as William launches his final expedition. The Conqueror's reign, though, ended as it had begun in bloodshed. William died in Rouen at the age of 60. Well, to find out more about this transformation from Duke of Normandy to King of England, I'm joined now by Professor Véronique Gazot here at the University of Caen. Thank you so much for speaking to us. Could you just start by telling me, what's the significance of where we are now to the story of William the Conqueror? Caen wasn't a city when William was born in 1027. He took control of Normandy in 1035, transforming it from a market town into a capital by first building this castle, where we're at now, which was important for defence. He also built two abbeys, Saint-Étienne, where he's buried, and the Trinity Abbey, which was built and operated with his wife, Mathilda. Professor, the fact that William the Conqueror's parents weren't married to each other, did that pose problems for him? Was that considered a bit of a scandal in, in those days? No, back in the 11th century it wasn't scandalous to be unmarried, but at the same time to have a child or children. It was in the 12th century that the church imposed Christian marriages and canon law, making children of unwed parents illegitimate. You should know that William was nicknamed the Bastard in the 12th century by an Anglo-Norman monk, Orderic Vittel, but who at that time was basing his argument on canon law from society at the time. Tell us a little bit more about the invasion. Was William the Conqueror a, a genius when it came to strategy? How did he go about preparing for that invasion of a foreign country? 
Yes, between January 1066 and the invasion of Pevensey Bay near Hastings in October 1066, William spent a lot of time preparing for battle. He recruited men from all over the place, not just Normandy. He prepared horses, gathered supplies like hay for the animals, food for the men, wine barrels, for example. Several thousand men and 700 horses crossed the channel in the end. It was quite a remarkably well-organized operation. William the Conqueror in the United Kingdom is a name that every child learns in history classes at school. But that's not really the case here in France, is it? You're right, things are so different from one side of the channel to the other. In England, I think children and teenagers learn about William, their king, but a king who was very cruel, violent, who sometimes in certain parts of England, like in the north, for example, imposed his force in the most terrible ways. While in France, history lessons don't delve very far into medieval Norman history, although obviously in our region, in Normandy, we're more interested interested in William the Conqueror than in the rest of the country. But he isn't a very important figure in the history of France. We're now in Dief sur mer about 30 kilometers north of Caen on the coast, directly facing England. It was here that William the Conqueror assembled his seven or eight thousand troops and built part of his fleet before setting off on his victorious journey across the Channel. He landed at Pevensey Bay on the south coast of England, just a short distance from Hastings, where his decisive battle was fought. Well, our France 24 team in the UK has this special report now on the indelible mark that William the Conqueror left on British history. King Harold versus William the Conqueror, a battle on this field near Hastings that would transform the course of English history forever. After Harold's resounding defeat, England's lords were toppled, and William's language, Norman French, replaced Anglo-Saxon as the country's official tongue, an authority that the new regime imposed by force. What changed was the creation of a new political entity, an empire, if you like, uh, which was cross-channel, a new regime which had a sense of its own importance as an empire and insisted on building huge cathedrals, short-term brutal change, a longer-term process of, uh, of adjustment, amalgamation and evolution. William's invasion had the backing of the Pope, in spite of the violent way it was carried out. He was the one who came across from France and conquered the country and killed Harold with an arrow in his eye. Few kings of England are so well known as the Conqueror, but opinions on his rule remain divisive. When we have events, um, if, if his name's mentioned, everyone boos. When Harold's name's mentioned, everyone cheers. So I think he's seen as quite a, a, a feared man. One of the country's most famous landmarks was built during William's reign on a Roman site to dominate London, the White Tower, England's earliest stone keep. The Norman Conquest is one of those fairly rare historical events where the change was immediate, enormous and obvious, and it's still obvious today. The, the laws of the land changed, the way people lived, the food they ate, the clothes they wore, the houses they lived in, the churches they worshipped in, the introduction of castles to England, which hardly existed before. William's cross-channel empire shaped politics in northwest Europe for centuries and laid the foundations for the Hundred Years' War between France and England. Well, perhaps one of the most famous depictions of those historical events of the Norman Conquest can be found here in Bayou, which is home to a 70-metre-long tapestry, a veritable storyboard of the battlefield there, the Battle of Hastings. Well, here to tell us all about it, I'm joined now by Sylvette Lemagnon, who is the curator of the Bayou tapestry. Thank you so much for speaking to us. Um, let's just be clear, we're not standing in front of the actual Bayou tapestry, are we? Um, we, can't, we can't actually film there, can we? Yes, the Bayeux tapestry is far too fragile to film. It's in a room that's almost pitch black to protect it. Okay, and tell us a little bit about 
how it was made and, and by who. Until very recently, everyone thought it was made in Canterbury at the end of the 11th century. And then some young art history students contested this theory. They suggest that it was actually made on the continent and potentially in the Loire area. This is, of course, a piece of work that was commissioned by the Normans. Should we believe everything it is necessarily factually accurate or do you think there might be just a little bit of Norman propaganda in there somewhere? I'd say it's both. It's corroborated with contemporary texts and chronicles. Actually, you learn more from the tapestry than from these texts, though. But it's also propaganda used to justify the invasion of England by William. OK, and just lastly, still that there are 58 different scenes on this 70-metre-long tapestry. Is there one bit that stands out for you as being a favourite? I really like the scene when you see the cavalry leave Hastings for the battlefront. They've achieved something very beautiful with very little. When you look at the number of cavalier faces, horse heads and legs, it doesn't add up. The artist cheated a bit and in doing so created a feeling of fantastical movement for this army leaving for battle. Well, we end this edition in the city of Caen, in the Abbey of Saint-Étienne, which was founded by William the Conqueror. And it's here that he was laid to rest following his death in the year 1087. Well, that's it for this week's edition. Thank you very much indeed for watching. See you again soon here on France 24.